Hi, my name is Fiona Hiscock and I am a ceramics person from Melbourne. I make quite large hand-built um, forms. You can see there's some behind me here. They're sitting on the piano because I've run out of room in my house and I'm really interested in the environment. So these forms are hand-painted a bit like you'd make a watercolour painting with layers of slips, oxide, stains. The forms are um, coiled built and look I guess um, I'm interested in making vessels just largely because I'm a woman and I like the fact that vessels link to the domestic. That I think they're very much about the feminine experience of life. I'm interested in the environment however as the painting source simply because I feel that it's such a crucial part of um, the, the planet's health. If we don't get our environment sorted we're not at we're, we're at risk as a as a population and I guess with my um, ceramics what I'm trying to do is give the life story of the plant in the one vessel so I look at the the fruit the spent flower and of course the bird life who makes um, these plants their home I guess I'm particularly mindful of the fact that colonization has had such a disastrous effect really on our natural environment it's had not a great effect on our first nations people so my aim is really to highlight the fragility and the beauty of um, the landscape that we all rely on for consolation for solace for our for our lifeblood thanks so this is the inside of my painting area you can see that's where I do all the actual painting apologies that the lights not good um, panning over table with pots waiting to be painted it's a very cramped space um, these are all my drawings that I use as reference material for each of the works they're done on watercolor and I refer, refer to them quite um, um, frequently when I'm actually painting the pots and then panning over here this is um, the current lineup of pots they're all stored on top of the piano because I've run out of space and I'm currently building a new studio in our back garden which I'm hoping will make life a little bit easier Jerry Webb and I'm a potter. I like making things that people can use and uh, I like the idea that when they use them it might kind of brighten up their day a bit, you know, like inject a little bit of goodness into everyone's day. In life. The process of making the cup consists of measuring out the clay the right size wedging the clay which is kind of like kneading bread then throwing the clay on a potter's wheel And trimming it on a potter's wheel and then making a little handle out of clay and applying that to the cup and pulling the handle off the cup and joining it and once that once that is dry then I um, start decorating Making cups and the images that I put on the cups comes really from everyday life, or what my everyday life. So images from songs, from other paintings, from books, from poems. Um, 
little highly charged objects from everyday life that I think may have a double meaning in some way so that um, so that when you use the cup when you drink from the cup again that maybe a little joke will suddenly appear that you weren't aware of surfing's been woven into everything I've ever done I think and so in that sense it's 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 taken me all over the place. Some people know me as a potter who serves and other people know me as a surfer that makes pots. The most similar thing about making pots and surfing is that in both arenas you're dealing with material that is sometimes solid, sometimes fluid, plastic and malleable, and you're responding to the material as you're making, in the same way that you're responding to the wave as you're surfing. If I have a reputation at all, it's probably as a pot of surfs. But really, if I think about it, the, the main thing that's on my mind first thing in the morning is what the swell is like, what the wind is doing, and what the tide is going to be doing, and when I can go surfing. So I suppose in the end, I'm really a surfer that makes parts. Someone once told me at the University of Wollongong, there used to be for the students in the student cafeteria, a hot, wet dish. And someone bought the noodles and there were two stories. There's one, they bought the noodles and it had a giant clump of hair in it. And someone else bought the noodles and there was money in it. Now they're both really disturbing, but I like the idea that my pot could be like a bowl of noodles with money in it. If I can make pots like that, I'd be really happy. I don't like the hair. <laughs> Vessels are so compelling and they are ageless. And it is that ambiguity thing about, it's not a sculpture, it's a pot. But is it? Because it doesn't really work, so maybe it is a sculpture. And I quite like art that works on really simple binaries like inside, outside, hard, soft. Those simple things are around because they're compelling for eternity. There are certain motifs that I keep coming back to and so the garden forms occur all the time in my work, especially succulents and cacti. I've used on a lot of these new pots the face of William Morris. He is a designer that I really admire and that people know his work. I quite like it that now I can sort of chuck him in there and he opens up all these other associations. There's this idea of the horror vacui, the fear of empty space, and that's sort of what I have. I think you can see a lot of me in these just because of my, it's, they're almost about my hands. Irony and humour, I'm not sure where it exists in the work. I, it's, it's funny, to me the work is sort of quite sad. I think people think I am a funny guy and I don't take things too seriously, but I sort of really do. I sort of take things so seriously that I have to hide it behind humour. I, I do often say, yeah, people say, what's your work like? And I say, it's like someone did a shit and they found a two dollar coin in it. It's clay, it's so, it's like poo, it's scatological. And I like it 
that you can make this really brilliant shiny thing out of this really base ugly material like it's quite compelling you turn it into something like that's eternal I've had things here where I've fired them and then I've gotten them out of the kiln and I've gone, oh, I've really fucked it up. And then you show it to someone and they're like, wow, that's the best thing you've ever made. And it's like, really? I think it's a piece of shit. And they're like, no, that's amazing. And then you start to think this is either gonna end up at the MCA or Berry Dump. I think both places are fantastic. Between the tip and the museum is the place to be. Maybe more towards the tip. <laughs> My name's Greg Daly and I live in Cowra. I've been now potting for 50 years, nearly 50 years. For the last number of years, it is my landscape, the sky, the atmosphere, the light, the, the way it changes, the hues, the intense reds to the blues, to the golds. That's what feeds into my work at the moment. The luster glazes suit it perfectly. I've been working with luster glazes now for many years, but only really 100% for the last eight years, 10 years. And they are capturing what I'm seeing. For me, it's that obsession of mining and playing with things that pushes me forward. And, and the work over the years has changed, and I'd say more evolved than changed. I can trace things back and I loop back on ideas and they stimulate the next stage of the work. Ceramics is a medium that really gets under your skin. It has so many possibilities. I began as a thrower and really most of my work is throwing allows one to express so many ideas. You sit down, start throwing, and it's that feeling of clay passing through your fingers and shaping the work. It's like a meditative period in the beginning of the body of work. In my work, the forms are very important because they are the canvas for the glazes to go on. You'll see in the throwing that I use a rib. I'm getting rid of my throwing lines because I need a clean surface for the glazes to develop their effects on. Coming back to luster glazes after a number of years, I did a lot of testing. But what's interesting that I'm only using a handful of them, five, six glazes. And those five, six glazes, by their application, be brush or spraying under and over each other, and then how they're fired, are giving me endless results. And I'm still mining after 10 years of working with these glazes. I'm still getting new results and pushing the boundaries. And it's the pushing the boundaries 
that excites me, that obsession of pushing things further and trying things differently. And that's the exciting part. The temperature is crucial in the outcome. Now, when they come out of the kiln, the glaze could be clear, but because they have things, materials like silver, bismuth, copper, and cobalt in, especially the silver, 30 seconds of reduction can give me a bright yellow at low temperatures. As I go up, that becomes a sort of apricot color, and then into um, silvery browns and a whole range as you get higher in temperature. But then you add cobalt, which on its own gives blue. But working with silver, you extend the color palette into greens and iridescent blues, a bit like a, a beetle. You can see all these colors in some of those beetles. Same principle of refraction of light. After the glaze firing, the work goes back into the kiln and I refire up to anywhere from 680 to 800 degrees centigrade. So when I get to temperature, I'll open start reduction and that's turning the burners, the primary air off. So I've got a, um, a very reducing flame. And then after 30 seconds, I'll just open the door a little bit and a flame shoots out up the top and I can see inside. Even the pots are red hot, the color of the flame is yellow and they're like a globe inside, so I can actually see what's happening. And then I'll close it again and give it another 30 seconds or a minute. It's like painting with flame and heat. So I can control all that to a degree. And that's the exciting part. You're playing on the edge. You're with the piece. And you're painting it with flame, basically.
ceramics for about four or five years now. My parents were both immigrants to Australia and they built a life here by themselves. And in watching them do that gave me the courage to take on a career as an artist designer. When I'm designing pieces, uh, I like to focus generally on kind of the broken parts of somebody's life. Uh, so the cracks, um, the parts where we feel like we're not getting anywhere or we're struggling. Um, I think they're kind of the defining points in our lives. If we can look back and find the beauty in that and find the strength to move forward and pass that. So I translate that a lot into my work and, and how that translates um, is I spend a lot of time focusing on elements of the world where that exists. So it might be cracks in the pavement or a crushed piece of paper or a broken twig or something like that. And I study it and extrapolate from it kind of the beauty and work that into a piece of ceramic. In terms of design principles and rules that I follow, uh, it would just be to make sure that I'm conceptually driven. Um, so that my products have meaning outside the realm of functionality. Um, I think artistic integrity in, in functional objects is something that's missing, or well, there's a gap in the market. Um, and I think it's important for people to connect and engage with the objects that they use every day uh, to make life a little bit more fun. I always go at, in a camp, I sing, I always sing by myself, when I wake up in the morning, I'll see oh everybody sleeping, I'll sing, uh -huh. I like sing, we sing everywhere, we travel in the bus, we sing a hymn, right through, through the city, uh huh. With Lily and David, we travel a lot, and then we all change back to Morris. I went Morris, Rose River, and then I had last trip in Darwin. I was singing in Darwin, and then I get a lot of cough, so I stopped a little bit. Quiet part of Nang and Wundumbara, same shape, Nang and yet Wundumbara quiet in Marvel. Yet Peter Mara was yet Narak, yet Narak, yet Nakanga. Then so hot on a choir, and they were very happy in 2019. They were very happy, and Morris was happy too. Because people like my podcast, we are happy too. When did I? Near to about three weeks or four weeks, months, I get finished at the airport and then. 
might be three or four weeks, one month, nearly one month. month. Try to finish in pot. Monja Doran. A monja. Look carefully, make nice shape, look round. Put everything pot straight so people can see on exhibition. Look round and scraping. And then I punish him with spoon. And then I start painting. All of my pot always go exhibition. Everywhere. <laughs> First, I saw American lady. She teach the ladies at the bush in Chamangura. And then they come back here to find this little building. They ask them cancel. And cancel keep this little building. And I always keep coming, you know. Always come. And they told me to, you would learn. Yeah, I'll try. And then I'll try. Keep coming, keep doing, keep going till I learn. And Naomi Shaba teach me how to make a pot. Pot that I'm dealing with by a good morning, and by a good night, and by a good I saw TV push fire burning in New South Wales. And then I make a pot. I was thinking to make a pot with push fire. Young Darwin and all of my family was very sad too when we saw TV. Copper little I'm pitching on them or anything of them life under other bottom. I always think that's why I'm making on a pot my country. Rani, Indaria, young old Arvindur was a proper sorry. Sorry, Indaria was a Kutu Adit Lara. When I come back from Alice Spring, I was thinking. I couldn't sleep night time. Too much thinking, you know, about wish fire. I put grey and then orange, yellow, mixed up with red. And then I put black with red, make a little bit darker, you know, like a little bit red on the fire. So I'm thinking, and on the grass, and I did make houses, houses behind the finish. This only make vitamin way. The people can walk out, they move, they only carry a little bit blanket, a little bit tucker, water, a little bit swag, sleeping bag, and they went out. And then I was thinking to make fire engine, fire truck, and put people with housing. Because I saw in TV, 
and Koala was running to people, you know, try to help, you know, too hot, no water, to try to run to people, and people caught Koala and all them corrupted Koala. Well, I work predominantly with ceramics and I have worked with porcelain for, I guess, about 15 years now. And most of my work explores the domestic realm and the humble, everyday, the minutiae, I guess, of the ordinariness of life. And I recreate these objects in porcelain. Porcelain has this really lovely ability to um, mimic other surfaces and, and textures and objects almost perfectly. In the process of doing that, they, they subtly shift ever so, you know, minutely, but enough that there's this sort of small moment of magic or alchemy that occurs, I suppose. A lot of the process I use is slip casting, which is traditionally an industrial process. It involves plaster moulds that are taken of original objects. Then you use a liquid clay which gets poured into the cavity of the plaster moulds. And then you've got this beautiful little ghost-like object. You know, it's a memory of an, an object from before. Um, it's kind of like frozen solid in time. And I guess the lovely thing about um, slip casting is I, I really like to play with those ideas of liquid to solid, like the buckets and the sponges and the soaps. They're these objects that are around liquid and about liquid and involved with liquid and I really like that they transform in the process of making from liquid to solid. So there's a nice playful relationship there. At the very base level, it's about bringing attention to the small unnoticed banal that we are surrounded with. And also that, that whole idea that we kind of measure life by the big moments and the big events, but it's, it's the grind that we kind of go through and the rhythms and routines of days that are, that are kind of the big things. My love or my interest for the mundane and the everyday is, is not going to, to disappear anytime soon. It's, I don't think I'm going to tire of it. It's the thing that, that does compel me to make. It feels like a rich minefield that, that is just always at your fingertips and there's a lot of poetry and metaphor for life that are kind of naturally within the material and the pieces. My connection with clay was quite immediate. I've had that kind of response that I see a lot of my students have, which is a kind of ad addiction where the touch of the material is more meaningful than anything. Perhaps because it's so responsive to um, the sense of touch, it conveys your sense of self back to yourself very, very clearly. It reflects it. So there's that nice communication that can happen through material and later that became the essence of a whole body of work for me. I discovered that it was something to do with the body and uh, more to do with not just my body but how then I create connections between my hands as a maker particularly and then to the user or the 
person who's connecting with my pieces in whatever way. So I became interested in exploring that connection much more deeply. I was really lucky to get um, a workshop training with a fantastic potter, Australian potter, Andrew Halford, um, after I, straight after I left um, university. And Andrew had come back from five years training in Japan and he was able to teach me Japanese techniques. So for the first time I was learning Japanese techniques um, in his studio with him in a fairly traditional mode of practice. So that was an extremely formative time for me and I was um, in a, working beside him in a big workshop with some fa fantastic other potters as well. And then um, at the end of the three years with him, Andrew helped me to get an apprenticeship. I had a couple of years in Japan at a wonderful studio called Shusai Gama. It's on the west coast of Japan. I had seven teachers. so. In that time, what I took away from that, one of the main things that I took from that experience was that seven teachers have seven different senses of touch. And I was able to explore that in later when I did the master's degree, uh, looking at how people's personality comes through their sense of touch in the reflective material that is clay. It was wonderful to, to realize that there's a language there it's almost invisible to most people, but it was a wonderful gift to me to, to then be able to bring that into my own practice. Recently, my work's taken a bit of a change and become a bit more sculptural and perhaps a bit more narrative. I was really lucky to be invited to put my work in a national exhibition called the Vitrify Al Corso Ceramic Awards. And it was an exhibition that encouraged the development of new work. So I felt like I was doing another master's degree all over again. But what really made me focus on my research more was my connection to a landscape around the Murray River where I grew up in northeast Victoria, which is a really ancient, beautiful landscape where the river has carved a pathway through the land for millions of years and I'm very aware of that having grown up there but also very aware of the power of the river, the power of water um, and some of the similarities with the materials that I'm using with clay, um, not just clay coming from the land but the water carving the clay as well and depositing the clay so it made me really aware that when I'm actually touching clay I'm touching millions of years of history in molecules under my fingertips. I've lived in various different places all over the world, mostly as a child and a young adult, and I feel part of the world. When I was five, we moved to Southeast Africa, and I was immediately captivated by the, the creatures, the insects, the fauna around me, the birds and the reptiles. They were so beautiful and intriguing, and I was also diving into stories from um, from Grimm's, Celtic tales, Hans Andersen, I loved fairy tales. And alongside these fairy tales, I was hearing stories from the Shona and Ndebele people of the African folklore. They all mingle together and stay with me, and I'm pretty sure they come out in my work because I'm constantly making creatures that are mashups. They're part creature, part plant, part insect or reptile, and they represent our interconnected nature of the planet. I take mythologies and stories and ideas from diverse cultures. Mythologies tend to coalesce around particular stories, so they're the creatures that I work with, they're my family. The work that I'm making at the moment represents an amazing biodiversity. I'm fascinated by conscious and subconscious lives that they have. What I try to bring out in the work is an idea of caring and an empathic response to all forms of life. Every time I create a new creature, 
You have made a personality, but you've also made a story. I love that because every creature has a story. I'm thinking about them. I'm dreaming about them and I'll wake up with their stories and try and draw out the particular personality of the story that's uh, going on in my head. <laughs> it's an ongoing obsession. What I love about ceramics, which keeps me coming back, is that it's such a versatile material and it is the earth. I think that you could probably work in ceramics for hundreds of years and never get to the end of the kind of forms that you can make with it. It has heart and soul and it's just a beautiful material to work with. The colours are so vibrant and beautiful. The spectrum is so vast and so complicated and frustrating at the same time. <laughs> but there's always wonderful discoveries to make along the way. And I'm constantly making new glazes or testing new glazes and mixing them differently and firing them differently. It's kind of addictive. I can't stop doing it. I still get up every day and think, yay, I'm going to make something out of clay today. Yippee. <laughs>
porcelain is a really difficult material in many ways to work with, but it's got so many compelling attributes that it's almost like an obsession. Even though it's difficult, you want to keep going, you want to keep trying to make that thing that you have in your head. I'm in the process now of glazing lots of work and that's quite a fraught process. Uh, you have to be quite meticulous about everything that you're doing. I'm making all my glazes from scratch. Metallic oxides and earth materials like silica and feldspar and kaolin, all in fine powder, all mixed together and then in a liquid form and a lot of them have a sort of cool blue kind of tone to them. And one of my very favourite glazes is a traditional Japanese glaze called temaku, a kind of molassesy black glaze. But if you take it out into the natural light, it comes alive like a night of stars. It has tiny yellow crystals, iron crystals through the glaze, and it's rich and thick. When I was six, I left my home. I was living in America and when I was six years old my parents separated and my mother and myself and my brother moved here to Australia and I felt like I was doing my own odyssey in a sense by going back as an adult and all the things I'd imagined about that place that had been my home as a child was very different, it was very different and yet really familiar and so I thought as soon as you take that step away from something that's familiar you are so altered and the, the familiar place is altered. It's just that amazing uh, and strange shift that happens all at once and happens on lots of different levels. And that's where I come back to what objects are and what do they mean to us and the power of objects and the power of collections of objects and, and those objects that travel with us and have resonance in other cultures and in other histories that maybe are different to the original purpose.